Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 421. What can or should we do to control drug prices? Or who's at fault? BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. We've been watching a lot of things in the news, but I think partly because of the election, but political candidates run and they give speeches, no matter, irrespective of their political party. They complain about the medical system, the insurance system, and drug costs. And they say, oh my God, somebody needs to do something. <laughs> and if you elect me, I'll do something. Then when they get elected, they say, oh, well, it's complicated. And nothing happens. And so we wanted to have a conversation to see if we could sort out what we understand about the complexities, because there truly are a lot of complexities. One of the first things that you ever hear when you start talking about drug, drug prices, if somebody's trying to come up with a new drug, the companies that make those drugs have to determine a price point. If, if they're bringing the drug to market, they have to get FDA approval. When the FDA says, okay, you, you can use this drug, then they set a price and they say, this is what we have to charge for this drug. Their first thing that they will say is, in order to be in this business at all, we have to recover our research and development costs. And God, they are so huge. They're so enormous. Nobody even understands the financial risk that we take to try to go down the road to come up with a new drug. There's a lot of contradictory evidence out there that challenges that argument. And you say, well, give us some facts. Give us some numbers. Let's, let's see what that involves. That's the first question. How come nobody looks at their numbers? Yeah. How come nobody in the government investigates what really did that drug cost? What was the research and development? What is the production of that drug? And who paid for that? And, I mean, a lot of times the federal government actually gives money to the universities. Right. The universities do the research, and then the government hands <laughs> free of charge the the, uh, the copyright, the patent, for the drug to a co- uh, pharmaceutical company. Here, put this out because we need it, and you can make all the money off of it. That works until they have to go to FDA approval. And our own government requires that it costs millions, maybe billions of dollars to bring a drug to 2.6 2. is the average cost. 2.6 million. Billion. Billion. To bring a drug through the FDA yeah. process. Okay? So the FDA is much more stringent than Europe. Mm-hmm. Euro- the European uh, Union doesn't have as stringent a process and doesn't cost as much, and therefore drugs get through and are available in Europe sooner than they are here. Now, our country will not allow us to use their research. Well, they won't share. There's a difference in philosophical approach. In Europe, the drug, the, the governments say, provide a drug that helps a lot of people, and we'll watch and see if the people that get harmed by that drug are significant enough that we need to do anything about it. But if well, it helps that's most how people, we operate, too. No. We say <laughs> if there's a conflict, if somebody, somebody has a problem, three people die, then we say, well, let's ban the drug until we find out why. We, that's We don't true. let them keep using it for the people that could benefit that's from it. That's true if it suits our purpose. <laughs> yeah. it, but, but in general, you see all these commercials where they have, you know, this drug could kill you, basically. This it yeah. could maim you. You could get cancer. You could, That's the really you know, fast thing they read at the end and, when they do all the side when effects. And when I listen to that, I think, how did that get through the FDA? Yeah. How did a drug that can kill you get through the FDA? And if, if it could get through, why don't we just let everything through? Because, honestly, the worst thing that can happen is you can die from a drug. Mm-hmm. So they let that through, and then they banned or did not let the testosterone patch for women through because it might cause facial hair. And I'm not kidding. That was it. So that's how silly this whole thing is. It's not logical. It doesn't follow a, uh, the FDA doesn't follow a um, process that says dangerous drugs, we're not letting them in. Safe drugs with a few cosmetic issues, we're letting in. I mean, they, they have another agenda in blocking different drugs mm-hmm. and allowing other drugs to come through. So so 
Like Vioxx? Like Vioxx. So there's two, there were two drugs that were, um, that were anti-inflammatories, but they did not cause trouble with the stomach. They didn't cause any irritation to the stomach. So these two drugs were used, Vioxx was used by the gynecologist for pelvic pain and endometriosis and a lot of things that have to do with cramping and things like that, severe cramping for women. And it gave women a lot of uh, freedom, of freedom from pain. It was not a narcotic. It was, it was like a very specialized Motrin and it was much more effective than Motrin, and it didn't cause ulcers. I've had an ulcer from Motrin. That's not, it's not fun. So this is a drug we used all the time. I used it personally, and then all of a sudden, that drug was used not off-label, but outside of the range of the, what was recommended by the FDA. It was used by a few people or some people who were older, and it caused them supposedly, and then we're not sure about that, to have heart, heart attacks. There's, there's no physiologic good reason why this would cause a heart attack because anti-inflammatories are like aspirin, and they actually decrease your clotting, so it doesn't cause heart attacks. In other words, but the big issue was there were two drugs that were competing. One drug gets pulled. The other drug's left there, and the price triples. So at that time, you could spend three to five hundred dollars a month because they have a monopoly. In the market. They're they're a monopoly. So yeah. the FDA made it possible for Celebrex to be the monopoly. Who knows why? Who knows where money changed hands? Somebody came from one drug company to another, but they put one drug out of business, and this other drug then took over and decided they could charge whatever they wanted for it because they were the only game in town. And that's how the FDA plays the game. That's a problem. Because then the American people are paying, it's a problem two ways. The American people are paying for a drug that does, isn't worth that much. They're just the only choice. And another drug went out of business. The drug company lost money. And they put in all this money into Vioxx and it's gone. Mm -hmm. You can't even find it in Canada or in um, Mexico. So it's not a bad drug. So, so we start with the R&D cost for pharmaceutical companies that manufacture drugs. Then they get through all of those hoops and they make a price and they say, this is what this, this costs $1,000 a pill mm -hmm. and it's for a specific illness. And then they let doctors know it's available and doctors say, oh, I, I've got people that have that issue. I'll prescribe that. Well, then you get into insurance. Does that individual have insurance? Uh, or if they go to the hospital, does the hospital discount the price? There's no, there the is a price. The hospital generally won't give it. They don't have that in their formulary. They'd have to bring it in because they don't carry. Well, formula is another thing I was going to mention. Right. To explain what a formulary is. A formulary is is basically if you're in if you're in a hospital, the hospital decides what drugs they're going to keep on site and what drugs they're not. And the really expensive exotic drugs that are for unusual diseases, they don't keep on site. They have to get approval to get those drugs into the hospital for a specific patient. Or if they're like a, a level one trauma center, a level two trauma center, they have different drugs, like, like right. uh, snake toxins. Right. They might have, or might not be there at your Right. So your it, local it depends hospital. on where your hospital is and what that what they are. The formularies also come up when we talk about insurance companies. Right. Because insurance companies, when, when you buy health insurance, you buy a policy that covers maybe, say, drug prescriptions. Your insurance company creates a formula. This is a list of drugs that we will approve and pay for. If your doctor prescribes a drug that isn't in their formulary, they'll refuse to pay for that drug. And they'll say to you, well, we have three drugs over here that do the same exact but thing. But they don't. <laughs> Why don't we give you this drug? And then you say, well, but my doctor said I, I should be taking this drug A. And they say, well, no, we don't do drug A, but you can have drug B and we'll pay for that. Or you can pay cash. You, you know, you can get drug A, but you got to pay for it. So... You have so the formulary. So then you have the uh, pharmacy benefits manager company uh, that manages the distribution of drugs to all the different pharmacies. They have their own formularies, and they have their own contracts, and they set prices for the for the pharmacist. Like if you go to Walgreens and get your pill, they've gotten that from the benefit manager company. They tell you what to charge the patient, and then they cut a deal with the insurance company for a discounted rate. Right. So every one of these levels gets your money because, first and of all, you're paying your tax dollars for that FDA to not approve a drug you really need and to require an outrageous amount of research 
just to pass a drug that might still be dangerous and they might still pull off the market later. So that's number one, tax dollars. Then you're paying for your insurance or Medicare, which also it has a level of cost to you. Then there's a level of cost to the benefit manager, a b level of cost to the, the pharmacist, pharmacist right. a level of cost to to um, your insurance company. So you're paying all these costs. So a dollar, you can't ever get a dollar pill. The dollar pill is going to really cost, when you get to it, is going to be $25. So, so the end point is that nobody pays the asking price except the uninsured and the really poor. Yeah. So if, if you've got a, a group plan, an insurance plan, or connection to the pharmacy, or if you're on Medicare or whatever, there are discounts everywhere. But on, but it has to be this basic, you've paid everybody in line. Already. Already. It's so it's already in it. inflated yeah. because of all these different levels right. that you have to pay for before you ever get to the point where there's a negotiation process. So the market for drugs in the United States is in excess of $370 billion, with a B, dollars a year. That's why all these interests are involved in trying to get their piece of the pie. The pie is enormous. And everybody wants to, to monopolize their part of it and make sure they make the money that they want to make. For instance, there was um, an article that we just read in what was the magazine that the it was um, it was healthcare management. Healthcare management is a magazine that physicians and, and nurses and, uh, and hospitals hospitals read. get. There was an article about drug cost in healthcare management, and they quoted the uh, the head of a company called Nostrum Laboratories. Arbitrarily over a weekend raised the price of his drug 400%. And so then they said, oh my God, why did you do this? And he said, and I quote, because we have a moral responsibility to our shareholders to maximize their return on investment. So it doesn't can enter into the consideration process. What's the impact on the patient if they don't get the drug? What's the impact on the patient if they can't pay for the drug? We have a lot of people in this country that need medicines that are available to live. that have to make a decision because of their income and their insurance standing on whether they buy food or medicine, whether they pay rent or get medicine. So they try to cover all their bases as, as any human being would. And so instead, instead of taking their heart pill every day, they take it every third day because that's all they can afford. Mm -hmm. And they just hope that'll be enough to take care of them. Yeah. And that shouldn't be happening, but it is. Yeah, and the so why does this happen in a free market nation? Because this is not a free market for drugs. Yeah. Because we have given the pharmaceutical companies all kinds of pathways and easy we ease their way to charge whatever they want for any drug. In fact, there was a movement to have Medicare pro be um, have a stockpile, not a stockpile, but a, a central pharmacy that would get the drugs at a price the government negotiated and then sell them to the patient or sell that or, or provide them through Medicare. And that never happened because that would be harming the pharmaceutical companies. Well, that's and, crazy. I mean, and, and so the rules yeah. get manipulated. The, the EpiPen is a good example. Yes. They created the EpiPen, which is an injectable epinephrine pen that they can use for uh, people that have allergic reactions. And they passed a law that required all schools, all hospitals, all police departments to have EpiPens. All doctor's offices. All doctor's offices. Have, you got to have an mm -hmm. EpiPen because somebody comes staggering in, their face is swollen, they can't breathe, and mm -hmm. you just give them pop right there. Right. So you got to have one. By law, you have to have one. Then... As soon as the law was passed, the EpiPen company raised the price from $50 a pen to $600 a pen because they could. And then their market share just exploded income revenue into that company because everybody had to have one. And now they cost $600. It's insane. And there was no competitor. Now there's a competitor. But there is no moral value. For any of these companies that say, they say they're providing you morally, they're taking care of you, that's BS. It's business. Yeah. They care about the holy dollar, and that's it. They are not caring whether a patient can get their drug or not, or if hospitals have to raise their fees, or doctor's offices can't raise their fees because we're controlled. So nobody 
everybody's getting squeezed except big business and big business based on pharmaceutical companies and insurance companies, met health insurance companies. So I learned from my COO how any um, fee can be figured out. And basically he said, it's what, it's the price that people will pay. That the market will bear. Now, if you have a drug that's going to save your life, then you'll pay whatever you have to pay to if save your life. If you had a life. child that was going to die if it didn't get a drug, you'd pay anything you get your hands on right. to provide that to that's that child. Right. And, and it people do. And it shouldn't be that way. So this is something that in the past there has been some moral control of drug, of drug costs. But now we've got insurance companies in between, Medicare in between, and that takes the pharmaceutical companies farther and farther away from the patient. And when you get farther away, you tend to not discount the importance of the person that you're making this drug for. And well, that's, that's a psychological and a fiduciary problem. And as Will Rogers said in the 1920s, we have the best government that money can buy. That's true. So what happens is the pharmaceutical companies, the big industries, the medical industry, lobbies Congress to pass a law. For instance, Congress passed a law that said that Medicare, the largest consumer of pills bulk in the country, cannot negotiate a bulk price rate with drug companies. Mm -hmm. By law, it cannot do that because that's too powerful of a, a share of the market. It would force the medical company, the drug makers, to reduce their prices. They said you can't do that. Not only that's that, crazy. they passed a law that said you and I, the average citizens, cannot go online and order the same pill, same brand, made by the same people and shipped to Canada and shipped to Mexico. We can't contact pharmacies in Canada and Mexico and order those drugs and have them shipped back to us at a third or a tenth of the cost. We have to go to our local market and allow ourselves to be scalped by the price. Right. Doctor's and that's office, your congressman in action, which is what we started. And doctor's offices as, as well. Yes. Doctor's offices it can't go outside the country, even though... A drug is produced in the United States, sent to Canada or sent to Mexico, and then you want to buy it back for your office so that you can give injections or whatever that is the exact same thing that was produced in the U.S. but sold at a much lower rate in those countries. Doctors can't do that without losing their license. Mm -hmm. So what we've done with that is decreased or wiped out competition. So there is no free market capitalism, free market capitalism yeah. when it comes to drugs. And we have wiped it out with our legislature. All these people running, for, I mean, until we get people who really give a rip, we're not, gonna, we're not going to fix this. And unless people s start screaming, I'm not going to take this anymore, mm -hmm. then it'll, it'll continue and it'll get worse. And that's what I'm really worried about. And that's why we're having this conversation. Our hope is that you, all of you who are listening to us, will scream and yell about this and contact your legislators and say, I will remember and I won't vote for you again unless I see that you're actively trying to accomplish something to regulate these drug costs and processes. Something needs to be done. Only you can do it. Increase competition mm -hmm. and demand that drug companies justify the price of a drug. I think that would help all of us. Lastly, loosen up the, the regulations and yes. then yeah, the, the regulations. cost that it takes to get through the FDA, much more like Europe has their standards. They still have standards. It's not quite as stringent as ours. Well, one way to do that is to close the, the revolving door at the FDA. That's true. If I go to work for the FDA and I'm charged making a decision about a drug for Merck and I am persuaded to approve the drug so that Merck will make $2 billion. Then I retire, and Merck hires me as, as a, a consultant. consultant. <laughs> so, yeah. Something needs to be done. That has, that has to be stopped. And part of what we're doing to fix that is we use compounded medications in our office. Not all of them are compounded, but we use compounded hormones, and that is a way around it. We have compounding pharmacies that will provide us with a similar medication to what we can't get in the United States or we can't afford. So it's at a, at a, a lower price. So that's one of our ways that we work around it, and it, and it is, is legal. Yes, it is. And safe. Thank you for 
being with us and listening to our ranting and raving. <laughs> I hope it causes you to think about it and it causes you to uh, write letters, emails to Become your... Become active. Yes, Get involved with senators, your congressmen. Yes, absolutely. And it has to be federal. The federal guys are the ones that are doing this yeah. and the ones that have the power. Thank you. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.